Today, I am talking with James Robert Lay. Welcome, James Robert. John, thank you so much for having me on today. It's looking forward to this. Well, it's nice talking to a friend. And uh, to begin, just tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been focused on recently. So I'm the founder and the CEO at the Digital Growth Institute in Houston, and we are on a mission to level up uh, the digital growth potential for financial brands. And I say even more deeply, um, it's it's doing so through education and coaching, really empowering financial brands to give them the knowledge to guide people beyond financial stress towards an even bigger, better, brighter future. Well, you're doing amazing work. And I, I've really been looking forward to this for quite a while because not only are you a thought leader, a uh, really recognized thought leader in the banking industry, um, also an expert in digital banking and marketing, but, and we'll get into this, you are the father of four. So I know you're going to have some very unique insights because you work so closely with these money-centric businesses like banks and credit unions. And I know in your work that you are always looking for connections across your different domains, including, of course, your domain as father of the lay family. So yes. let's begin at the beginning. <laughs> I want you to tell us how you first started the Money Smart Conversation and lessons in your household with your kids. But don't shy away from getting into the weeds here because it's really those details that I think are most useful to our listeners because I think here... The idea of this really podcast writ large is to give people takeaways they can try with their own family. I'd say it starts with me um, in gaining a sense of self-awareness as to what is my relationship with money. Um, I grew up in called the average middle class family. Uh, you know, mom was a teacher, dad you know, corporate America for 30 years. And one thing always stuck with me though, growing up, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. I heard that over and over and over again, mom, dad, can I get a Nintendo? Like this is like 1989, 1990. Can I get a Nintendo? No, can't afford it. Can I get a pair of Air Jordans? No can't afford it. And I don't know if we could or could not. That's not the point of this. The point is that those words really shaped my reality with money. And I would say it almost destroyed me to a, a degree because it forced me to go to the complete opposite end of the spectrum as an entrepreneur. Like I was never going to have my kids, never going to tell my kids that we can't afford it. Well, that's before you have kids. And then kids enter into the picture and then you're like, I have a responsibility to guide them and really empower them to establish a positive relationship with money. And that's what my wife and I have been really focused on is to, if anything, let's just talk about it. Let's have some conversations about it. Um, and that's everything from, you know, what it costs to put food on the table and four kids with the environment that we're in right now. It's getting a little bit more expensive to, you know, what it costs to go eat out, compare and contrast the two to what it costs to, you know, utilities. Like literally it's, it's kind of a bit of a, an open book to a degree. Cause it's like, you know what, if we go out to eat and let's say it's a hundred dollars for the family, because my wife is very conscious of the food that she provides all of us and she makes for us and where we go eat. I tell my kids, like, look, if you were working at a job and making $10 an hour, it would take you 10 hours to provide this meal. Wow. So it's about context and I think perspective and no judgment um, is the most important thing, I would say. It's just really facilitating a dialogue, a discussion, and a discourse in a safe space that we're all learning together with this thing. 
do you have anything you do kind of systems wise? Like, for example, you know, we have, we've talked about a specific kind of allowance. Do you not do an allowance? Uh, are you focused more on the entrepreneurial side? What do you do kind of systems wise in your house to help, you know, to, to help uh, boots on the ground. You know, you've got the conversation, the open conversation, which is great. But what are you doing systems wise to help your kids kind of learn with, you know, physical money experience about how to use money? No allowance whatsoever. 100% entrepreneurial. And I think a lot of that is once again, as an entrepreneur myself, that drives that entrepreneurial thinking, or at least I'm trying to establish and facilitate the entrepreneurial thinking for them. So very practically speaking, um, my kids, they come to me, dad, I would like to buy X, Y, or Z off of Amazon. Great. First question I ask, have you thought about it? Yeah, I thought about it just now. No, I mean, like, give yourself a week. Come back to me. And if you still want whatever it is, let's have a conversation about it. And to be honest with you, I'd say more times than not, they've gone away and they've never come back and talked about it. Sure. Okay, great. So they come back and they want to actually buy whatever this thing is how much is that going to cost? So we have that conversation. Well, do you have that, you know, saved up now? Yes, I do. What happens if you buy this, then what is, what are your reserves? How much are you going to have left over? Then we have that. And then if they don't have it, then it's like, how are you going to go and create the revenue to buy this thing that you want? Um, that's one conversation we've had other conversations around and it's interesting from an entrepreneurial perspective. I'm like, okay, you've gotten all of this money that you've worked for that you not allowance, but they're looking for opportunities to generate income. I mean, even to the point to where they'll ask me if they can make me a bracelet and I've stopped doing that, but that was a good start. I'm like, now go sell those bracelets to your friends at school and take that to the next level. Um, but they saved up some money and they bought a snow cone machine. Um, and I'm like, okay, that snow cone machine off of Amazon was $50. You bought the syrups. That was like another $10. If you sell snow cones for X number, here's what your payback period is. And then you become profitable. So, the thing is, is they've never gone and done the snow cone machine. Um, so I'm like, that's just capital. That's just sitting right there. Whenever you're ready, you can go out and do that. So I, I, I say it's really helping them to identify opportunities. And now it's like, okay, you have the ability to, you know, use YouTube and all of these other channels that weren't available for me when first getting started. And I want to be very clear. I'm not encouraging my kids to go out to this whole influencer lifestyle. Um, it's just about being able to share and communicate knowledge, passion. So it's really just facilitating the mind into where can I find opportunities in life at a macro level to create value for others? Because it's through that value creation. That is how I create revenue. That is how I create income for myself and for my family. That is Great. Uh, that's very helpful. And it's, uh, it's a unique perspective. I have to ask you this. What do you think of the, uh, the advice that you should follow your passion? How do you think about that with your kids? I think you should follow your passion up to a point because can your passion be profitable there? And I learned this from David Baker, who has advised me over the years. Um, I would say my thinking has changed um over time with this but there are a lot of passionate people um who are struggling financially and i think it's the idea is to try to find the intersection of passion and profit um you you have to have both to be able to be sustainable and not everyone wants to you know go out in life and be a a gazillionaire or, or a billionaire but it's like can you can you find a life can you create a life and i think that's the thing we all 
you know, there's this argument that we're moving into a creator economy. It could be possible theoretically that people could find and create careers, businesses that are more in their passion spot now than ever before. But I think you have to be very mindful of passion and profit because uh, passion alone, yeah, it's great. But if you're struggling financially, then maybe we need to have a conversation and optimize what that could be. The passion could be the side hustle. Well, you've got this other thing going on over here that, you know, it's it's the primary revenue generator. Yeah. I don't want to jump back. That's that's very useful advice. And I wanted to jump back because I, I like your idea of the, we, we call it the waiting period, but that idea of letting them kind of sit with that I with that concept because we found the same thing with our kids and I want to talk to other parents about this same issue you give them a week and most likely whatever it is that they wanted is something that they're not going to care about within mm. a week or two mm -hmm. weeks so I think that's a really powerful tactic to use with your kids on anything the way we do it is because we do actually give them an allowance is it'll be something where if they have money in there you know they have to save for goals but if they find something that is say over fifty dollars and it is something they do, they have the money in their spend jar for it or yep. the spend smart jar, um, they have to wait on it. That's just a rule that we have. And now they're getting older, they have a lot, lot more kind of autonomy over everything. I mean, we've always given them some autonomy, but now they have a lot more. Um, what do you think about that? I would say one of the the best purchases that my oldest son, he's twelve, has made to date has been his pet beta fish um, because not only was it, you know, something that he worked for that he saved up for, it was something that he thought about. Um, and I'm like, you know, get this fish. You're going to be the one who cleans the bowl. You're going to be the one who has to feed the fish and to watch his level of responsibility increase and multiply through this, um, relationship with the pet betta fish uh has been beautiful and now he's like well you know i want to upgrade his tank you know i want to do all of these other things i'm like slow down cowboy because <laughs> he's just quite fine in his little one gallon fish bowl swimming around and you know you want you're gonna you're gonna go drop another 50 bucks to give him a three gallon tank with these led lights and it's just it's very it's almost like you know if you think about as adults, you know, we reach a certain level of life and, you know, we have our basic needs that are being met. And then we go out and we want to upgrade that level of life. And then we want to upgrade yeah. that level of life. And so it's even this is helping to facilitate that conversation of, you know, is it really worth it? Or is this something that maybe we can hold off on and wait and see? Yeah. And so your son is moving the goalposts for his fish. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And he, he is actively wanting to figure out a way to make it happen because this is the same one who has just such a love for animals. And yeah. I, you know, back to the whole passion thing, you know, I think now as, as a child, there's no better time to kind of like figure out and poke into different passion points mm -hmm. because that's going to help like my passion growing up was playing basketball you know but i there's no way i was going to go play in the nba it wasn't reality but it's the yep. same drive i have today that i applied back then i think those are the core behaviors and traits that we can instill in our kids like drive and motivation and just doing the right thing and being good human beings those are lessons that they can take for a lifetime that will then ultimately create value, which then have has a positive impact back to their bottom line going forward into the future. Yeah. And, you know, passion is always something that's worth uh, helping your kids pursue if they're interested in something. The danger becomes, uh, I like your framing of it, when you're pursuing it and it's not something that can really, is really sustainable monetarily. Yep. Um, and the other thing is, you know, you may lose your passion for something if you decide to try to go that go that route. And monetize it. 
Yep. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you've read the E-Myth by Michael Gerber. And yes. he talks about his, one of the simple examples he gets is just because you're very good at baking apple pies doesn't mean that you're going to be very good at running an apple pie business, right? Because by the time that you run the business, you hate baking the apple pies that you started the business <laughs> out to begin with in the first place. You know, yes. the the idea of, of of money, too, I think when it comes to our kids, because you mentioned four, they're 12, eight, or they're 12, 10, eight, and six now, is college. Um, People ask me, "Oh, there are like, where are your kids going to go to college?" And I'm I'm a contrarian by nature, I think. So I'm like, I don't know if they're going to go to college. And they look at me like I'm absolutely crazy. And I said, it's about value. Um, I said I'm already talking to my kids about you know possible certifications. Um, you know, you can go get a Google certification in UX um, at the age of 16. And then go out and start creating value at the age of 17 or even the age of 18. So there's this mm -hmm. whole idea of formal education versus education in other means or mediums, uh, I think is is something that that we can look at. Even my wife, I've a lot of conversations about college early on when the kids were young. Well, we're gonna pay for our college because her parents paid for her college. And I paid for my own college between grants and scholarships and student loans. I started my business at the age of 19, 20. That put me through school. And I, I feel that that really helped me to respect the education that I was getting at the time. On the flip side, with her, we went to the same university and we've known each other since honestly, like the fr first year, freshman year of first day of school, freshman year of high school, although we were not high school sweethearts. I told her at the age of 18, I was going to marry her. And she said, you're crazy. Six and a half years later, <laughs> we got married. And, um, but her thoughts are now, no, our kids are going to be responsible for their schooling. If that is the path they wish to choose. I also think about the future of the United States at a macro level, um, if I look out to like the 2050 time period, and from everything that I'm reading and seeing and thinking about, we have the potential for a, a manufacturing boom. And, you know, we could possibly see the trades go super hot again. Because right now it's like, no one wants to work in like the blue collar world. My wife's father is an entrepreneur who is in that blue collar space and i'm like it's when everyone else is zigging you go zag and you go find the opportunities elsewhere so perhaps trade school would be a path for my kids that i would 100 percent support them in and i think that's the thing if if that is what is helping to fund their passion then it's like a win-win-win everyone is, is winning so it's it's just looking at the world from a different lens with my oldest son being in sixth grade, college is getting pushed on them to the point to where they have teams of students and teachers, and they're named like Team U of H, Team UT, Team a and i I'm here in Texas. And I'm like, it's, I don't know. It makes me just question. It's like, who's, who's benefiting from this type of, I'll say it indoctrination at uh, you know yeah. the age of fifth and sixth grade like facilitate possible paths forward you yeah. know i think i think two three paths it's like the old robert frost poem two roads diverge in a yellow wood i took one less travel and that's made all the difference i think yeah. if we could just facilitate the thinking and if you go this way this is what your life could look like if you go this way this is what your life could look like yeah i think you're I think more people need to question college. This isn't to say that they, the kids shouldn't go to college, but at the price that you're paying for college, you have to be thinking about the value. So I think it is, I, I, I think it's essential that you do consider it because the price is so high that it, you really have to make sure that it's, uh, there's a proven value. The other thing, when you're talking about these teams and everything, it starts Reminds me of something. I can't remember who said this, but this, you know, youth is not about, I think it was Alan Watts was talking about this idea that we're, mm. you know, we're, we're 
where we go to kindergarten to get into elementary school to get and this is even more true now than it was when he said it to get yeah. into a high school then to get into a college it's like youth is about being a you being a kid right yes it's not yes. about like the whole existence is not our their existence shouldn't be about getting into college and i've been as guilty as anybody and kind of promoting that with my kids uh, because it's part of what the schools promote. But the more you think about it, you realize you know, youth is about being a kid. It's not it's not about the end goal. And certainly the end goal is part of it, but the journey right. really matters. Well, you bring up Alan Watts and it's the idea, you know, I, I think in, in school, it's all about like doing and the accolades and the, you know, this, that and the other and we're not human doers, we're human beings. And I think the more that if we can remember, like we, it's all about the experience and and, and we're gaining and what we're learning from this. And in in no way, you know, someone might be listening and think like, this guy's like anti-education. I, you know, once again, my mom's a teacher. I would say I'm an educator with, with the work that I'm doing. I'm, I'm advocating lifelong education and the way that we can educate ourselves has now transformed because of things like the internet. Um, even, you know, my wife was saying the other day, um, you know, encyclopedia, uh, we have an encyclopedia set, uh, Britannica actually was a gift from my parents to my kids. And it's been up on a high bookshelf and we're like, you know, we're going to pull that down because they're asking some really good questions now. And instead of me just, you know, giving them the answer, it's going to, the answer is going to be, go look it up and report back to me. Because I think, you know, with my worldview, I'm in a very unique place. I was born in 1981. The internet hit mass consciousness in 1994. I was 13, 14 years old. The fact that I could look at an encyclopedia and be able to connect all of these different dots and look for patterns allowed me to progress much quicker when I got a Google search bar and start to connect all of these dots. Um, so reading and education, you come back to the idea of how, how do my kids earn dollars? Um, I have, over time, they come to me and they're like, how can I earn some, some, some dollars? How can, I, how can I earn some money? Like, go read a book. Go read a business book. And so I have different businesses, business books um, that they have read. And it's not just read the book. And depending upon the length of the book and, you know, how challenging it is. And they started doing this, you know, I would say my, my, my daughter, my, my oldest daughter, who's now 10, she's very entrepreneurial. Maybe at the age of eight, she started reading, reading some of these books. Um, and they were written by Dan Sullivan over at Strategic Coach, who we were talking about before. Mm -hmm. Short reads, easy reads, but it's the concepts. And I'm like, read the book, do a report for me and then present to me and you can earn five dollars and so while it might take her a couple of hours the value she's getting and how that is shaping her worldview at the age of eight nine ten my goodness you know it, i wish i had that when i was her age yeah i, I love that idea of uh you know, adding to their coffers through learning makes makes a lot of sense because that value is going to kind of pay dividends for for both for her and for you. Um, you were going to say something, James, Robert. It, it's it's not it's not just it's it's the learning. It's then being able to distill down what she has read. See, my mm. oldest son won't do this. Like he just will not do this, and I. I that's fine. That's not for him, but for her, it's reading. Then it's the writing and the distill distillation of the ideas. And, and I think most importantly, it's her being able to articulate and then communicate what it is that she has learned, written about, and, and how, and synthesize that and how that is through her worldview. I've never really thought about it until just this point. But she was elected uh, president of her of her class, and I'm curious to know if all of that practice that she had leading up to this influenced her because she had to give a speech and create a unique point of view as part of her, you know, campaign platform for class president in fifth grade and 
I think it's only fifth grade, but once again, these are like life skills that they'll take on for decades to come. Yeah. And just having a comfort with them. I mean, it's no different than having a comfort, you know, starting that conversation to have a comfort with money, you know, whether you do it through entrepreneurship, whether you do it through allowance, it's really developing a uh, comfort using the tools, right? Developing mm -hmm. the skills. So now she has, as a tool in her toolbox, the ability to speak publicly, the ability to sort through her thoughts by writing. I mean, that's, yes. you know, both of us have, uh, you know, written books and we know the value. Uh, the best part about writing the book is really that it just forces you to, to make sure that your thinking is fairly clear. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> And that's a wonderful experience. And it's great that your 10 year old is figuring that out at that age, because I was clueless at the age of 10 about the power of writing. And again, that I would agree. I, yeah, I think a lot of that also comes with the fact that we are living in a time where it's fairly easy to find that information on YouTube. That's, you know, be, people will talk about social media, myself included, about, you know, the, the, the net negative that is there. And, and I, I think there's, there certainly are uh, negatives, but the the fact that you can go on YouTube and basically educate yourself about virtually anything, at least on a, uh, a basic level, is astoundingly powerful. And um, and one of those things happens to be writing. I mean, in this case, she's got you as a, as a mentor as well, and that's that's doubly powerful. I, I think you're onto something there because that's something that. I have considered as my kids get a little bit older, I might coach them into communication via YouTube. Um, do I even say TikTok? Do I want them on TikTok? <laughs> like, I, I think that's the other thing. Like, so my kids, you know, they did not have an iPad before COVID. Um, they do not have like an Xbox. They have like a, my old school Nintendo that I finally bought. Um, it was actually a Sega Genesis that I bought because I cut yards and I bought it from Tommy Lucas who lived down the street for a hundred dollars back in like the early nineties. And I got all the games with it. Like they were playing that as kids, but I want to coach them into, okay, communication. You know, um, all of these life skills, because then it's like if they create a a mini presence for themselves, regardless of where it takes them into their 20s or into their 30s, but let's say they're 14, 15, and then now they read a book and now they write something up and now that they flip that over into a download, like, you know, for example, I'm going to find a book um, on my desk, uh, Rehumanize Your Business um, is just one that I found, or or the coaching habit. Um, if they are able to articulate a point of view and teach something, you know, to someone else, and then YouTube begins to monetize that, well, that's just another income stream. I think the internet as is to the printing press, you know, five, 600 years ago, it's just at an exponential pace in our minds are the limits into what good we can utilize these tools for. Like you said, there's a lot of negative, but I'm like, let's keep focusing on the positive and the value creation here. Yeah. I, th I think that the negatives are that we've been running this kind of social experiment with social media without really understanding the, the, the yeah, the sociological aspects of it. But the major positive positives are, so for example, and we, we don't want to get you know too far into the weeds on this, but something like people and there are there are concerns about AI, right? Mm. And and AI getting out of control, you know, the movie version of AI. But on the other hand, when you think about the opportunity for our kids, and I, I try to kind of steer them into looking at the power of AI, you know, I'll have them just go on and try Dolly and create their own pictures just to see what generative media can look like because it's going to be a part of their lives. There are going to be negatives and positives, just like nuclear energy. Uh, you know, when we, that you know, there's going to be the positive side, energy generation, the negative yep. side, um, you know, atomic bombs. But the thing with AI is that if you look at it as the, the potential to kind of 10 X our knowledge, you know, if you think of I, I think of it as uh, in a, the most simplistic way, just having an AI assistant or an AI buddy 
that helps you think through things that you just couldn't think through on your own because you're a human. So you're just human plus, right? And there's that. more than anything, it's about it's about exposing our kids to these things so that they can kind of then sort out how they'll be useful to them. So I've never really considered this before. And this is why I just enjoy conversations like this. I think what we're doing, and I'm I'm in agreement, like AI is a a human upgrade. Um, it gives us capability, just like a Google search gave us capability. You know, we're all augmented at this point, walking around with mobile devices in our pockets. Um, <laughs> but if we look at these as tools, like for example, if, if we were having this conversation and it was say 1822, we would be teaching our kids how to use a plow or how to use a hammer. These are just modern tools that back then were capability upgrades for people of that time. These are now capability upgrades for, you know, people of our time and our kids because it is the world that they're growing up with. And so when you think about the idea of, of the art of allowance and making deposits, I think as parents, it's not only a monetary deposit that we can make into to their, to their account, we can make deposits like I've been talking about of empowerment, of life skills, of um, thinking about things, thinking about things differently. That's an exponential deposit. Like I could give you $5 to read the book, but I think what's going to take them even that much further, that $5 to read that business book, what does that create over their life? It's You yeah. can't. You can't, it's going to be very hard to quantify that. But I think if you look back to the time that, you know, they're, you know, 220 years old, um, if, if life extension gets us that far, um, it's going to give them a huge, um, and I don't like to use the word advantage, um, because I think then you're looking at things in a very competitive mindset. I want my kids to be able to take what they know and then apply that and help other people along the way. And I think there's that part of allowance that goes into this too. So there's the, the the monetary part of allowance, but then there's also the depositing of these life skills, these values that have exponential reach over the course of their lives to help other people. Yeah, I like that. And I like the idea that you don't want to necessarily talk about advantage because that is there is a kind of zero sum feel that yeah. comes out of that. And I know you are the kind of person that is probably familiar with the idea of the infinite game because you play that infinite game, right? We're, we're all on this journey mm -hmm. and we just want to help our kids, you know, help themselves, help others. And the, that's, you know, I, I tend to be more techno utopian, uh, even though I do see the potential downsides of it. It's just, I think it's just been uh, drummed into me from uh, from a young age, having just discovered computers at a young age and, and, uh, and, and just loving to, just seeing what kind of power they have, but getting at the kids, when you think about the, the essential nature now of video, it means mm. that it's m even more important that we address this issue. I, I don't know what the number is, you know, it's uh, whether it's real or not, but you know, 97% of people don't like to do public speaking you know, that's something that's that's something that almost everybody's got to get past, right? And so you're yep. making these deposits in the public speaking side. The writing, I think, is more important than ever. The ability to write, to write, to communicate asynchronously, especially now that we're moving into a world, our kids are moving into a world where they're going to be doing a remote work. The writing mm -hmm. and asynchronous co communication is, writing is essential to that, right? So you are making those deposits i love that framing of the non monetary just there you're 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 generating um you're kind of just building up their assets through these deposits that you're making into their accounts that aren't necessarily monetary accounts i think that's uh i like this i think this is something to chew on i have to think a little bit more about it i think another practical example for the dear listener here is goal setting um goes very closely with this and literally I have my kids write down like what their goals are but not from like this lofty pie in the sky very specific like 
my son is an orchestra. He plays the cello and he wanted to be first chair, but he was struggling. And I said, listen, I want you to sit down and I want you to leap ahead in your mind. And it's 12 months from today. And I want you to look back. What needs to happen between now until then for you to feel good about the progress that you're making on your cello playing journey and write all of that down. Like you're living in the future state and bringing that back to the present moment. And so there's that act of writing. Once again, I think back to your point about AI, it's co-creation, it's collaboration. The more that we can teach our kids to co-create and collaborate, not just with other human beings, but with technology as well. What does this come down to? It's their ability to just think, critically think, solve problems. Um, and, and when you put people at the center of your, your thinking and of your doing, and you put the common people problems that cause common people pain at the center of your thinking and doing, that those are those non-monetary deposits that they're they're going to take with them for a life I, I can't wait for one of my kids to read napoleon hill's think and grow rich then we're gonna have um and and you know i've been reading a lot of that over the past you know five years myself but i think it's interesting that the, the writings you know were written in like the 1920s the 1930s very similar time periods to where we're at 100 years uh william waddles um the science of getting rich and, you know, how thought plays into all of this. Um, it's just, to me, it's a very exciting time to be alive. It's a very exciting time to be a parent um, yeah. and to to do what we can to help, you know, help guide our kids along what you and I have been talking about, this, this journey of life that we're all learning through. Sometimes you're the teacher, sometimes you're the student, but we're all here to learn together. Yeah. You know, th th those two books have certainly stood the test of time. A new book, that have you read psychology of money by morgan housel i have not it's actually my bookshelf though okay yeah that that was our kind of go-to gift for because our kids are 17 and 19 so we had a lot of kind of college graduates and i'm sure when they open the book you know these college grad or not college graduates high school graduates going to college they probably looked at it and go, Ugh, book but it's a it's a short book and housel says in the book it's short you're welcome yeah, it is one of it's it is a such I think an essential read for kids. Um, and I'll, I'll we'll put that in the show notes. But uh, but the idea here, again, that 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 these kids have, I, I agree, I think it's a it's a wonderful time. I think it's also difficult for kids because there's this paradox of choice that's coming in here. You know, we mm -hmm. look at it as the parents and we think, gosh, you have so many opportunities they look at it and it can be very overwhelming because they you know, you have to kind of find your filters. You know, I found that with my younger daughter happens to be, want to go into an architecture program that helped filter it. Whereas my older daughter wasn't sure, which is perfectly fine, but it made it much more difficult in the application process because it opens up. It's, a, it's actually too many choices, I think. Um, so that's, that's, that's another uh, thing that our kids have to deal with, but you know, it's, it's really a wonderful problem to have. Now, I know we are at the time end here. Do you have an extra kind of five to 10 minutes so we can? Of course, of, okay. of course, okay. just, just, just for you, just for you, man. <laughs> okay. I just, I just want to be sure, cause I have to get my fast and fun round questions in. And I think we'll just jump to those now uh, because I have a whole bunch of other questions I would like to ask. Maybe we'll just do this again uh, at another time. But let's go to our fast and fun round questions, unless there's anything else you wanted to kind of piggyback on from the re previous conversation. No, let's go ahead and hop into it. And always ha happy to come back and, and have a chat with you. Okay, fantastic. Here we go, James Robert. First question. What does the term money empowered mean to you? Money empowered means that we have not just only the knowledge, but we have the courage to make the hard choices um, that we need to make. Sometimes it's a sacrifice in the short term to reach a much longer term goal. Thank you. What is the best investment of time or money you've ever spent on your kids to date? Sitting down and having deep conversations about the meaning of life. I love that. You're the second person in a row that uh, that went to time on that one, which uh, is so meaningful uh, with our kids spending that time with them. Yeah. 
What advice to your kids uh, do you most hope that they will heed? And this could be monetary, but it could really just be life advice. Think beyond the present moment. The future always, from your perspective, has to be bigger than where you've been or where you are. And a lot of times that bigger future comes not from thinking about yourself, but from thinking about how you can help other people around you. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting because one of the things that we talk a lot about, even with our kids, is the being kind to your future self, which is mm. very difficult. It's a difficult concept even for adults. Uh, but you know, they're they're basically adults now, 17 and 19. My my daughter, I was very proud because my one of my daughter's college essays was about treating her future self well. And uh, so it was nice to see that that message was coming through on some level. Okay, so if you could transmit a message that everyone would see sky written on a billboard, wherever, what would that message say? I would say it's probably how I end every single one of my podcasts. Um, be well, do good, and make your bed. Um, and a lot of this comes from a place of when you are well yourself, um, emotionally, physically, spiritually, financially, you can go and do good for other people, but it, it all starts by making your bed. And what I mean by that, it's the little things that matter most. Um, sometimes they can seem insignificant, but when you create these small micro habits over time, they do go out and they pay dividends. Yeah, it's like, uh, is, the, is the book, uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff and It's All Small Stuff. I think that's the... Uh... <laughs> that's exactly right. Okay, now, um, other than uh, Napoleon Hill uh, or William Waddles, what is the one parenting or money smarts book, frankly, it could be podcasts, really any media that you go back to or that you gift the most often? And feel free to elaborate if it's more than one thing. Well, obviously, there's the art of allowance. Um for sure. But I would say there's another one that sits on my desk. It's uh, it's by Chad Willardson. Um, he wrote a book called Smart, Not Spoiled, The Seven Money Skills Kids Must Master Before Leaving the Nest to see what he's been able to do. We, we share a lot of the same perspectives around empowering people, more importantly, empowering our kids uh, to, to, to do the right thing um, when it comes to making decisions, not just in money, but just in life in general. I'm going to have to uh, pick up that book. Uh, we'll put that, all this uh, information will be in the show notes, of course. So thank you, James Robert. Uh, in closing, how can people find you on social media and or the web? Uh, just Google me, James Robert Lay, L-A-Y, just like the potato chips. Distant related, related, but not close enough to get any free chips at Christmas. <laughs> And finally, what's one action that you would like uh, anyone in our audience to take that would be helpful to you? If you have kids, go sit down with them. Ask them how they want to grow. Ask them what their goals are and, and use that question about leaping ahead, you know, a year, three, five, ten. And I think the the shorter the horizon line, the easier it is for a child to perceive that future. Because when you're 12, thinking about 20, that's a long time. But when you're 12, thinking about 13, much easier to understand. Ask them what their goals are. Get them to write those goals down from a future state like they've already lived them. That's number one. Number two, grow as an acronym, roadblocks. Facilitate a conversation about what potential roadblocks stand in the way from them achieving those goals for growth. And then finally, opportunities, the O. What are the opportunities that they can take? What are the actions that they can take to overcome those roadblocks to not achieve those goals, but to just simply move forward to make progress towards those goals, celebrate that progress along the way? James Robert, I'm not surprised you're leaving with uh, leaving us with some inspiring words, and I just want to thank you for having this conversation with me today. John, thank you for sharing the time with me. It's been an absolute honor and pleasure. You're welcome.